everybody. Well, it is a, it's a wonderful morning. There's Darlene. Feeling good, I hope? Yes, we're good. We're good. Oh, good. Praise Lord. Good morning. Well, we have a nice service plan today. We're going to be talking about pride. We're going to be talking about how, how it affects our lives. Last week we talked about the measure of a man, which was talking a lot about humility, but today we're going to be talking about the, the peril of pride. But we're going to start right now with some worship songs. We're going to start with a bang. Your grace is enough. If we can stand together, we'll start. Here we go. Here we go. I need my glasses. Let's see if I can tell the song. My mommy and sister. <laughs>
is enough, Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for this church and all who have come today, Lord. We have so much to be thankful for. Help us to count our blessings as we seek you with the whole heart, Lord. But bless this service and help us to feel your touch, Lord, today. Help us to get close to you and feel the feeling that comes from when you fill us with joy in your love. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to serve you, and I thank you for all who come. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's one called the sweet presence of Jesus.
be seated, everyone. We're going to do a song called Reach One More Soul. We can. Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, 
and he shall lift you up. James chapter 4, verses 5 through 10. Praise the Lord. We're going to be talking about pride and humility and things. Kind of a carryover from last sermon. Next week we're going to be talking about it's prayer time for America. And it'll be a heavy one on what's going on in America and things. But today we're talking about pride. And right now it's time for our giving. And we can have our usher come forward. Our ushers, thank you very much. And we're going to sing one more song. Be lifted up. Sweet. 
right now, we have um, a special time right now. Ron, would you come up right now? Oh, no, let me do the scripture first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what should I do first? Check it out. Um, <laughs> that one I do is first. <laughs> Who had a birthday this last year? <laughs> this last month. You had a birthday? Any, anybody else? Any anniversaries? Well, it's happy birthday to Dana. Okay. Happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dana. Happy birthday to you, only one will not do. Born again means salvation. How many have you been? in many forms, and many times it seems like the more educated people get, uh, you know, the more prideful they become. It's unbelievable how that works like that, but it does. It makes me think of a story about a fishing guide and a college professor. I heard of a college professor who went fishing and he hired this guide, and they were out there in the river and the college professor was full of himself. He was full of his vast knowledge and everything. And he asked the fishing guide, he said, well, what do you know about biology? And he said, well, yeah, I don't know very much about that. 
professor said, well, that's just too bad. He said, you missed a big part of life. I don't know biology. What do you know about geology? Well, I don't know that much about geology, sir. Wow, that's too bad. That's such a shame. Such a pity. What do you know about botany? Ooh, well, sir, I don't know that much about that either. The professor said, well, that's just too bad. My poor boy, what a sad life that you've lived. He said, well, what do you know about history? He said, and I said, well, I really haven't been a student of history much either. And he said, well, that is just too bad. He said, that's just sad that you don't know that much about stuff. And then he went on talking about all of this intellectualism and all the smart things that he'd done and everything. And went on, and pretty soon, at that time, they got a bite. And one of them got a bite, and he pulled the string really hard, and the boat flipped, and it tipped over. And it was sinking, it was going down. Well, the guy got in the water, and he was swimming to the shore. When he got to the shore, he got up, and he turned around, and he says, what do you know about swimming? He says, nothing. <laughs> Too bad. Too bad, he said. And the wise man is ignorant, and the strong man is weak, and the poor man, I mean, the rich man is poor, but he doesn't know the living Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I used that story. We've told that story before and everything, but it really shows pride. We're going to be thinking about pride today. Last week, uh, we were measuring a man, and we talked about humility and stuff, but this week, we're going to be talking about the pride and the sin that keeps us from humility and things. And we're going to be talking about the problem with pride, and we're going to start with a word of prayer right now. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for this opportunity to serve. And Lord, I just pray that you would just uh, bless this message and anoint it and uh, touch the hearts of the people, Lord, and help them to grow and learn about ourselves and stuff and some of the things that you want us to know. Lord, I want to hold up Darlene. I'm so thankful that you heard our prayer and she's doing better and everything, Lord. And I'm just thankful for that. And all others who are out and sick today or not with us and stuff, I pray that you would just bless them. But for those here, Lord, I pray that you would open their ears and hearts and minds up, that they would receive this, that they would really be able to grow and help us become more like you. There is a problem with pride, we see. But Lord, we're going to talk about it, and I pray that you would just anoint it. So, Lord, I turn it over to you right now. I thank you for everything you're doing. And we turn it over and ask for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The problem with pride. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have difficulty with the problem of pride? I want you to raise your hands. How many of you have a problem with pride? Okay, well, you know, um, I'm going to be talking to you, people that raise your hand. But not primarily, I'm going to be talking to all of you that didn't lift your hands. Because every single one of us wrestles with pride. And pride is a dangerous sin. I don't know of anything that would hold back revival more or ruin damn our nations or blast our lives or do more to take the power out of our Christian lives and do more to populate and build a place called hell than the sin of pride. And I tell you, it is such a damaging, destroying sin. It is such a deceptive sin. You know, many people who are the proudest least admit that they are proud. Many people think that they don't need to hear a sermon on pride. And they say, well, my goodness, if there's one thing I don't need, and that's a sermon on pride. And as a matter of fact, they're quite proud of their humility, aren't they? And many of us have pride that is well hidden, but it is right there within you know, one man said to another man, as they were talking, he said, at least I have the one thing, there's one thing, I don't have the difficulty with the sin of pride. And his friend, well, why should you have any difficulty with pride? You haven't got anything to be proud of. I've got as much to be proud of as you. Well, you see, pride is there, incipient in all of us, truly. And what a deceitful sin it is. But we need to understand that pride is not. Now, we call many things today pride. We use the word pride to describe things that are not really pride. For example, a good self-image is not pride. I mean, a self-image is not pride. Pride is not having a good self-image. Or pride is not receiving honor. Those athletes are not necessarily proud in the bad sense of the word when they won a gold medal for the Olympics. And I mean, they all received that medal and had a sense of gratefulness and a sense of achievement. That's not the kind of pride that the Bible condemns, and we're going to see that in a moment. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks of giving honor to whom honor is due. Now, I put up this one because immediately I see honor it, and Don put it up, 1 Timothy 5.17. I didn't put it on your outline, but I'd come across it, and it says to give double honor to elders 
especially to those who labor in the word and doctrine. So when the Bible says we are to honor someone, we know certainly it's not a sin to receive honor. For example, you're to honor your wife. Husbands are to honor their wives. The Bible teaches us plainly. And when a man says to his wife, Honey, I'm proud of you. If he means it in the sense that I'm giving you honor, that's fine. Or the Bible says, for example, that a wife is to reverence her husband. And that's all right for you to give him a pat on the back and say, Honey, I'm proud of you. And that's what most of us need. Because ultimately a woman is to a man what a wind is to a fire. She can fan it up or she can blow it out. And we need to encourage us. We need wives to encourage us. It's clear that God gave them to us. And we see it's all right to encourage people. It's all right to say, I'm proud of you. And that's what sometimes our children need too. They need a pat on the back or encouragement and let them know that we're grateful for them. I heard about a couple that had been married for about 60 years and they were sitting around the front of the fire and he looked over to her and he had sort of a romantic twinge and she was hard of hearing and because of the years and he says, honey, I'm proud of you. And she said, what? He said, I'm proud of you. And she said, what? And he said, I'm proud of you. And she said, well, I'm tired of you too. <laughs> but really, it's all right if you're proud of someone to say that you're proud of them. And when the Bible uses the term pride, it doesn't condemn a job well done. And truly, you ought to do your work with pride. If you sweep the floors, you ought to sweep the corners. And there's nothing wrong with in dressing that you dress nice. I mean, you're not humble because you go around looking like an unmade bed. That's not the sign of humility. That's a sign of sloppiness. Now, we are to be certainly take a certain amount of what the world calls pride and embrace it in the way that we work, in the way we dress, in the way that we do our job. And ultimately, that is just a healthy respect. And I want to say that not only does the Bible not condemn it, but the Bible literally encourages it to edify one another and encourage each other. But anyway, I want to tell you what I'm talking about. Pride, I'm not talking about the self-respect. I'm not talking about conscientiousness. And I'm not talking about giving and receiving honor that is due to be given or honor that is due to receive. So what is the pride that the Bible so-called condemns? I mean, what is bad pride? On your outline, number one, it is an attitude of independence from God. And it is saying, God, I don't need you. I can do it myself. Now, this attitude of independence from God is what the Bible calls pride. I keep thinking of that poem and stuff. You've heard it on the Dead Boat Society. I am the captain of my soul. I am the master of my fate. But I feel like saying, well, captain, your ship is about to sink. However, there are many that feel that they are self-sufficient without God. You know them. You run into them. They don't need God and their self-sufficiency. I mean, that spirit of independency apart from God is what the Bible calls pride. And ultimately, that independence results on your outline in a sense of ingratitude. What do you got to be grateful for? You did it all yourself, didn't you? Which is also one of the facets of pride. You see, when a person has a base of an ungrateful spirit, ultimately then that, that individual is proud and it's because he does not acknowledge God who has given him all that he has. All good things come from God. The Bible calls the attitude of independence the attitude on your outline of ungratefulness. Now this attitude of independence and ungratefulness is pride. And that attitude causes us therefore to measure ourselves on your outline by one another. And to esteem ourselves by comparing with other people. Comparing to see if we're better than someone else. And if we have that attitude again, all of this is a matter of pride. Now let's see if we can narrow the focus just a little bit more. And right now, I want to give you some tests for pride, some indications for pride. Let me ask you a few questions. Number one, it's not on your outline. <laughs> Does it irritate you when somebody corrects you for your faults? Does it bother you when people tell you that you're wrong or correct you? Number two, do you find yourself accepting praise for things over which really you have no control? I mean, for like natural abilities or natural gifts and things that God's given you and things that have, he's bestowed on you and yet receive the praise unto yourself rather than acknowledging that God who gave you the ability and passing that praise on to God? Well, if you do that, if you don't pass it on to God, you are proud. All good things that I have come from God. I might exercise them and improve them, but without God, I would fall flat. 
And third, are you the kind of individual that when he does make a mistake, you always have an alibi, always has an excuse. They never admit they're wrong. Always justifying that mistake until finally they excuse that mistake. Do you do that? Well, that's pride. When somebody wrongs you, somebody does something you don't like, do you ever say, well, I can get along with that person. I don't need him. Well, that sense of self-sufficiency, not needing or not wanting another brother is pride. Sin, do you find, the fifth thing here, do you find it difficult to seek counsel and ask others for advice? Is that hard for you to do that? Are you the type of individual that says, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do? You know, some husbands don't even want to drive into the service station and ask for directions. And we just want to figure it out ourselves. Of course, if it was anybody else other than me, that would be pride. But that's pride when you're too ashamed or afraid to go ask somebody else and humble yourself. Do you have an ungrateful spirit? I mean, by not accepting graciously what God has given you. Perhaps grumbling because what God has not given you. You know, grumbling as if something is owed to you. We can't do that. That's pride. Because having Jesus should be enough. It should be enough. Seventh thing, final one, is your life a, my, a life that is marked with competition. Do you measure success by other people? By victory over other people? Because you see, pride is not simply just wanting more for yourself, but it is wanting more on your own than what someone else has. And pride is a sense on your outline of competition, which shows us that somehow we should win, or we inherently deserve more, or we feel like that we've been jipped, or we feel it's, we should have something better than somebody else. Now, all of these things are indications of what I'm talking about. And it's that spirit of independence from God. It's that spirit of the lack of gratitude. And it's that spirit of competition that causes us to think of ourselves somehow better than others. And I tell you, that is the spirit that God hates. I want to talk to you about the parable of pride. I want you to look at Proverbs now, and I want to see five things in Proverbs, five points on what pride does. Then I want you to see how we can deal with the matter of pride. The first thing on the list the pride does is that pride provokes deity. And what I mean by that is that pride angers God. Let's look at Proverbs 6.16. 6, 6.16, these things that the Lord hate, yea, Seven are abomination to him. Now first it says, and look at it, what God hates is a proud look on 17. So one, a proud look is the very first thing. Now according to this, you can sin by just how you look. And you know, some people can strut around by just sitting down. And a proud look, just with a proud look. And the Bible says God hates it. Well, let's turn to Proverbs 16. And by the way, we're going to go back and forth in these Proverbs today. In chapter 16, verse 5, it says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Did you see that? He attests it. And he will punish it. Because it says, Everyone who is proud in their heart is an abomination to the Lord. And that's what we see. And wow, it's an abomination. And that's something. God hates it. Well, why? Why does God have this great antipathy? I mean, this hatred. <laughs> why does he have this for pride so much? Well, we have to back up. Here's why. It's because of what pride does. Now listen, on your own, if there would have been no pride, there would have been no devil. Now the devil began with the most glorious created being that God ever created. And the Bible says that he was full of wisdom and beauty and he sealed up the sun. That means he was brighter than the sun. And God had never made anyone more exquisitely beautiful, more wise and more powerful than Lucifer, the son of the morning. He was the angel of the light. Now the name Lucifer means light bearer on your outline. Light bearer. And the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel that he was perfect in all of his ways and that is until iniquity was found in him. And that iniquity was pride. And the Bible makes it clear that it was pride. You know, Paul talks about pride. He describes pride in 1 Timothy when he's talking about a new preacher or someone that would like to be a preacher. The Bible says, don't let him be a novice. That is a newcomer or someone without experience or someone who is not mature. 
Because the Bible says that if you do, he might be lifted up with pride and fall into condemnation of the devil. And the same thing can happen to him that happened to the devil. Because it was pride that made the devil the devil. Now you know the devil didn't really have very much experience on uh, going through a life like we do. He didn't need to get saved and find out how horrible sin was. He just immediately was accepting praise in a glorious atmosphere. And he meant, and immediately was a novice at it. Because he hadn't gone through the trials we have. That's the thing about making us saints. All the problems that we go through in the world, you know, and it says not to make a pastor, you know, too early in life because he's got no experience of the problem of sin in the world and God's plan and knows how disciplined that you must be in order to go ahead and, and work for God. And the same thing happened to this man that would happen to the devil. And it was pride that corrupted the most glorious creature that was ever created. And not only was it pride that made the devil a devil, but also it was pride that ruined, on your outline, the human race. What was the bait on the hook that was the devil used when he seduced Eve? Now, she wouldn't have done that for a little piece of fruit. She had all the fruit in the garden. It was more than just that tantalizing taste of the fruit because behind there, there was this tremendous pull, this tremendous pressure, and he appealed to her, and he put pride in your heart, and he told her, you will be like the Most High God, and if you eat it, you will be like God. And so you see, it was pride, therefore, that ruined the race, and it was because of that, it was pride that brought sin back into the world. And every rape and every murder and every pillage and every bit of dishonesty, every bit of perversion, every bit of cruelty and hell, all suffering and all sorrow is ultimately all sin was brought back into the world at that time. And I tell you, you can say that pride did that. It was pride. You see, if there was no pride, there would have been no devil. And if there would have been no devil, there would have been no fall. And if there would have been no fall, there would have been no sin. And now the world is full of sin. It's like a Pandora's box. And that is why the Bible says that these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination or detestable to Him. Now do you hear me? They all come out of the very first one, pride. Pride is the basic sin, the root sin, because pride on your outline is the sin that leads to all other sins. It's like a gay pride parade. It is a sin of independence of God, not wanting to live God's way. And you see, pride is wrapped up in, on your outline, not believing God, not believing His Word. And it says, love letter to us. But why do we not believe God? Well, it's because we think we know a better way. And that is pride. And the first thing I want you to see is pride provokes deity, which means... You provoke God to anger. And I'm saying that when there's pride in your heart, you've got to understand that it's not that God is not going to help you. It's that God literally on your outline becomes your adversary. He is your enemy when you have pride in your heart. And the Bible says that God resists the proud and God stands to bring the whole universe against the proud man. So a proud man has God for an adversary. Okay, so sin provokes deity. Well, here's another point I want to say about pride. The second point, on your outline, it proves depravity. Pride proves depravity. That's our sinfulness. Pride proves our sinfulness. Sometimes, and really so often, people don't think they're sinners. Because they say, well, I don't cuss, I don't chew, and I don't go with girls that do. They say, well, I'm all right. I don't do this, that, I don't do that, I don't steal, I don't kill, I don't murder, I don't do that. But they have a sin that is way worse than all of that. That is pride that's in their heart. All those, all those other things came out of a prideful heart. Look what it says in Proverbs 16, 5 again. It says, everybody who is proud in heart is detestable or an abomination to the Lord. I mean, that's where it only has to be, just in the heart. It never even had to reach the hands or the feet. Then you have to reach there. So just the pride in your heart, just what you're born with, is an abomination to God. You don't even have to act on it at all, but it's still there. And it separates us from God. It says, a high look and a proud heart. And Proverbs 21.4. Proverbs 21.4. A high look and a proud heart. And the plowing of the wicked is sin. 
Wow, bowing of the wicked. That's an amazing verse. What do those have to do with each other? Well, think with me. Let's take a farmer, for example. I mean, one who does not acknowledge God. And he thinks that he doesn't need God. And so he goes out and he plows a field. And certainly he's not robbing a bank. And he's not committing adultery. He's not practicing sodomy. He's not beating up his neighbor. He's just plowing the field. And for us, it's like we're just doing our job. But the Bible says that the plowing of the wicked is sin. Why? Well, it's because he has a proud heart. And if he has a proud heart, then everything that he touches is contaminated. You see, the man or the farmer that does not acknowledge that the soil comes from God, and the farmer that does not acknowledge that the sun and the rain come from God, or the farmer that does not recognize that it's God that makes the seed grow, and I mean, when he realizes it, doesn't realize that, I mean, he says he is absolutely, utterly dependent on God. If he doesn't do that in his business, he is a proud man. And we'll talk about that in another sermon in James and stuff. But basically, he is filled with dirty, rotten pride. There are so many people where their greatest need is just to see their need. They don't realize that when, men, when God looks at man, God doesn't look at man like man does. I mean, he doesn't look at what you have or what you make or anything like that. But man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart inwardly. And ultimately, it's the pride in the heart that proves your depravity, your sinfulness. How did the pride get in the heart? Why do we have pride in the heart? Well, I think of what I read several years ago, and, and it's a pretty good illustration, that if you have an apple, and you look at the apple, and it has a wormhole in it, and you think, oh, I better be careful, there's a worm in the apple. But there's no worm in the apple. The hole is not there so the worm could get in. The hole is there so the worm could get out. Huh. And the worm is not bored into the apple. The worm is bored its way out of the apple. And you say, well, wait a minute. How did the worm get in the apple? Well, the worm got in the apple. It was born in the apple. He was hatched in the apple. How did he get there? The egg was laid in the blossom. It was laid on the apple blossom. And then in time, the apple blossom became an apple, and you see it was already there. That worm was already on the inside while the apple grew. And that worm ate its way out. And now likewise, the pride that's in your heart is already there because it was born there in your heart. And you see, it's what's in your heart already. And when that worm comes to the surface, that worm was already in your heart. And we've all got pride worms. Jesus said in Mark 7, 20, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of the man that defiles him. And Jesus says, for out of the heart proceeds pride. You see, we were all born children of Adam and Eve with a predisposition to sin. We're all born egotists, which is just another word for pride and sin. We are born self-centered, and it needs controlled. It's like this, if you give a little baby a sack full of candy, more candy than the child could eat, and then you say, after giving him that candy, can I have a piece? And they'll say, no, it's mine. That's the selfishness of a child. And you know when you have a little child, I knew you were there, probably something like this may have happened to you. I know probably it did happen to me for sure. I can't quite remember, but I've seen it enough times where you're surrounded with 15 toys and you're playing with one of them and really you forgot about all the others. And then someone comes to visit your mother and puts another baby on the floor. And that other baby went over and picked up one of the toys that you're not even playing with. And you just left your toy, you were playing with him, went over and took that other, another toy and bopped him in the head with it and took his toy away from him. Because you didn't want him to have that toy. And it was because you wanted them all for yourself. You see, pride is just born right in the heart of man. And it's just like that worm in the heart of the apple that just simply comes to the surface. And it proves our depravity. And I'm telling you, there's not a mother's child, there's not a person born that is, that, that is not egocentrical. Now, some more than others, true. But I'm saying it is not something that we learn, it is something we inherit. And I mean, you do not have to teach a child how to be selfish. No person has ever taught a child how to be selfish. Now, they may encourage it or help it grow, but ultimately, you have to teach a child not to be selfish. Now, that's true, isn't it? We can see the sinful heart in children. Now, because by nature, I said by nature, we are selfish and egocentrical. 
And by nature, we all want to come into this world wanting to be our own little God sitting on the throne of our own little self, worshiping at the shrine of our own ego. So not only first, pride provokes deity, it angers God. And secondly, pride proves depravity is that we're born sinners. But third thing on your outline I want to say about pride is pride produces dissension. Dissension. That's friction. Did you know that there's never been a war? There's never been an argument? There's never been a fight? There's never been a scuffle? There's never been a disagreement? There's never been an argument somehow that wasn't rooted in pride. You can't get mad unless there's something that makes you mad. And truly, pride is always a part of all of it because pride promotes deception, dissension. Excuse me. Let me tell you something else. In Proverbs 13.10, if you read with me, it says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with, all, but with the well-advised is wisdom. But only by pride cometh contention. There's never been a war that where there's not been a major factor. There's never been a church that where pride wasn't a major factor. Never been a divorce that pride wasn't a major factor. There's never been an argument that pride was not the major factor. It breeds quarrels. And you say, well, are you certain? Well, the Bible says that only by pride comes contention. Only by pride. But maybe you say, well, our case is different. We've had some real genuine problems that weren't caused by pride. Well, listen, I'm not saying that you didn't have problems. I'm saying that the pride kept you or is keeping you from solving those problems. Because there's no problems too big to solve, only people too small to solve them. And the reason is that we have arguments as husband and wife is that we do not attack the problem. We get upset and attack each other. And it's ego against ego. And I tell you, only by pride comes contention. And those problems could be solved. They could. For example, what happens in a marriage, like when a boy and a girl decide to get married? Well, let's say, let's say that uh, Mary, we'll call her Mary, and the boy is James. And Mary hasn't given her heart to Christ, though, and she's unsaved. And remember I said, she's born e egocentric. She's born not uh, wanting to be the queen of her own little life. She sits on the throne of her own life. And there's James now. He's egocentric. He's self-centered. He's selfish. He's full of pride. He's born wanting to be the king of his own little kingdom also. And so we have Queen Mary and we have King James. So we have Queen, Queen Mary and King James get married. And what happens? They move into a little house trailer. Or they move into an apartment or a tiny house or even a mansion, whatever. But now you've got two kingdoms under one roof. Remember what Jesus said, that a house divided is what? It cannot stand. And before long, there will be a war between those two kingdoms. Maybe a cold war where they're just not speaking at each other. Or maybe a hot war. Maybe they're going to be throwing a frying pan. I don't know. But after a while, a tragedy takes place, and it's called a divorce. And it is tragic indeed, and behind it all is pride. Well, let's turn it around. Let's suppose that they would have done this. Now imagine this. Suppose Mary became convicted of her sin, aware of her pride and her selfishness. And I mean, not that she's a terrible, horrible person. I mean, she's not an adulteress. She wasn't a thief or anything. But she realized that rather than being God-centered, that she's self-centered. Rather than seeking the glory of God, she's seeking the glory of self. And what she thinks she deserves, or what she thinks she wants. And she ultimately, she realizes that she's been living for self by doing that. When you get saved, you get this realization and you start understanding these things. But she repents of it and she humbles herself and she dethrones self and she enthrones Christ. And so she turns her life over to Christ. And instead of seeking self-esteem, she's seeking Christ-esteem. And she says, Jesus, I recognize you are Lord. I recognize that you have every right to rule over my life. I yield my heart. I yield my life to you and your commands. And I enthrone you, Lord Jesus. You are number one. And then suppose James over here said the same thing. He says, I repent of my sin, Lord Jesus. I receive you. I dethrone self. I enthrone Christ. And I make you number one. So you see, when self is on the throne, Christ is on the cross. But when Christ is on the throne, self is on the cross. We talk about it like this, picking up your cross. That means you're starting to listen to Christ. You're starting to obey his rules and things. So I dethrone self and I enthrone Christ. Now, Mary does that, James does that, and Christ is on the throne of both of their lives. Now listen, the Jesus in Mary is not going to fight with the Jesus in James. 
The Jesus and James is not going to fight with the Jesus and Mary because you don't have two kingdoms anymore. You have one kingdom with one king who rules over all. And it's Jesus. Therefore, when a problem comes up, it's not that Mary and James are not going to have any differences. No. But they have a rule book to go by now. And now we have instructions. Boy, I guarantee Jackie and I have had lots of differences. And you know, this is America. She has a right to be wrong. But we have a lot of differences. I'd hate to be married to someone that differed with, though. And how dull that would be. Listen, if you always agree, one of you is not thinking. It doesn't mean that you aren't going to have differences, but it means that, friends, those differences have to be worked out. But you know, first, pride had to be dealt with, where you don't attack the other person. You finally come to the place where you can finally attack the problem. The Bible says clearly and plainly, only by pride, only by pride, only by pride comes contention. Only pride breeds quarrels. You know, the devil would rather start a church fuss and sell a barrel of whiskey. Any guy would believe that. And you know what? I mean, he'd rather do that than open a porn shop or anything like that. He would rather see the church fighting amongst each other. He loves saints quarreling. He loves marriages quarreling. He likes to see you fighting. Likewise, if churches would just stay humble before the Lord and the members of those churches would just seek God's face and love one another and be willing to supplement ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we'd never have any contention. We wouldn't. Honestly, we may have problems, but not contention. Not contention. There's always problems, but not fighting over it. All right, now what we have said is, well, first I said that pride provokes deity. It is an abomination to God because of what it does. And secondly, I said that pride proves depravity. You see, any time a person has had pride in his heart, it is there and it's born in him. It was incipient in him. And also remember that Jesus said it is what comes out of his heart that defiles him. Then the third, pride produces dissension. On your outline, I mean, if you are not right with God, it's no wonder that God says we cannot be right with one another. We have to be right with God before we're going to be truly right with one another. Fourthly, pride promotes dishonor on your outline. Tell me something, that has irony in it. Do you know what the proud man wants on your outline? The proud man wants to claim the claim of other people. And uh, the, truly the reason is because he wants it because he's proud. He wants the claim of other people. However, you know, as we've explained before, there is nothing wrong with having honor because the Bible says we are to give honor where honor is due. And also God says that who honor me, I will honor, God says. But the sad thing, and I mean the terrible thing about it all, is that the proud man that wants it the most is the man that loses it. You know, a lot of the things in the kingdom is kind of backwards with life. When you strive for something really hard, you don't get it. But when you strive for the Lord, you get it. It's a sad thing. It's a terrible thing. The proud man wants it the most is the man that loses it. Look what it says in Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor is humility. We talked a little of that last week. That verse tells us how to have honor. So we know it's not wrong to be honored, and it's not wrong to have honor. And the Bible says that give honor to whom honor is due. And so we see first, before honor is humility, and before shame is pride, and it puts it like this, before destruction is haughtiness, that's before shame is pride. And so it's clear pride produces dishonor. In Proverbs 18, 12, it says, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Boy, he keeps saying it. God says it over and over and over in Proverbs, doesn't he? Look at Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. And so we see over and over and over, the Bible tells us that pride promotes dishonor. Now, do you know why that people are so proud and why they live in such a prideful way? On your outline, it's because they are wanting honor. Most people that are prideful are wanting that honor. And what's ironic is that's the very thing they don't get. I mean, have you ever been around a conceited person? I mean, it's a person that reads with conceit. Well, I have. And you know, somebody said that conceit is a disease that makes everybody sick on your outline. 
except for the person that has it. That's really true, isn't it? And really, he is the one who is the sickest of all. And the proud person or this conceited person thinks by all of his actions and his prideful ways that he's going to gain somehow the admiration of people. But he loses the very thing that he wants. Because pride doesn't bring honor. Honor outline, it brings shame. Pride promotes dishonor. Jesus said, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. But whosoever abases himself, the same shall be exalted. And ultimately, it's just simply a principle of life. Let me show you something. Here's a good illustration. Of it. Let's turn to Isaiah 14. And here, you don't have to, Don will go there. God is asking a rhetorical question. And here's the question. How did the devil become the devil? Let me read verse 12 of chapter 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? In other words, he's saying, what happened to you, Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground that weakened the nations? And he's saying, what has happened to you? What has made you what you are? And then he answers the rhetorical question, but first, Satan's words, he still reviews Satan's words of 13 and 14. He says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. And he says, I will, I will, I will, five times, I will be like the Most High. In other words, I'm too beautiful, I'm too wise, I'm too cunning, I'm too strong, I'm too mighty to be anything less than God. And I'm going to be like God. And you'll see some of these religions and stuff where they pretty soon make the people, the saints, like gods. I won't get into that now. But we see that there are some religions that want to turn ourselves into being a God. And we see that this is his downfall for Satan. He exalted himself and he had no humility. And he didn't even know the restraints because he didn't know anything about sin. Now listen, what was he seeking? He was seeking praise. He was seeking adoration. He was seeking adulation. He was seeking honor. He was seeking fame. And look what God says in verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. That's another sermon too. To the sides of the pit. And so we see Satan said he is going to go as high as one can go. But God says you're going to go as low as you can go. In verse 16 it says, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. And it means they'll stare at you. And they're going to ponder your fate. And it says they're going to look carefully on you. They know, we all know that Satan's going to be thrown in the lake of the fire after the millennium. But in the millennium he's going to be tied to the sides of the pit. So we can all look at him. And they'll stare at you and ponder your fate. They're going to scrutinize you. They're going to observe you carefully because of all that you've done. Verse 16 says, They look narrowly on thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the one that made the earth to tremble and to shake the nations? And verse 17, it says, Is this the one that made the world a wilderness and destroyed the cities of thereof that opened not the house of the prisoners? And I'm telling you, one day, that means he has people in bond. And I'm telling you, one day in the ages to come, the devil is going, to, is going to be put on exhibit and all the created hosts are going to come and all the saints or all the ages are going to see him. They're going to say, come on over here. I want to show you something. Look down there in that pit, squirming like a worm in hot ashes and he's in humiliation and shame all because of pride. And being seen there in ignominious defeat will be the devil. Now, when you look at the devil, everyone is quaked about the devil these days because the devil has caused so much destruction. And here in the people, look at the chaos that we have. The devil entices people to do these things and make these evil decisions against God. And there's a, there's a big thing where people are going against the will of God and Satan is behind that whole thing. When you're looking at the people destroying things and not wondering what they are having in their mind, they don't have to have anything other than their mind but taking orders from Satan wreck everything, destroy everything. Satan is out of chaos. That's what he wants, chaos. When you look at the devil, everybody seems to be quaked at the devil. And they're fear. The people are afraid of him. The devil strutted in all of his arrogance, but it doesn't last. And we're going to see the devil in his rebellion. And it's in the millennium when we see the devil down there in the pit. And what I'm saying is when you see what's going to happen to him, you'll say, you mean that's the devil? 
I mean, that's him, and that's the one that made the nations tremble, and that thing down there, the lowest of lows, that's really him? And they'll say, yeah, that's him. You see, pride brings shame. Satan is humiliated when they stare at him, and when they narrowly look upon him. So I want you to think with me before all of that. Remember where Satan said, I will ascend? Well, look at the contrast, because it was Jesus said, I will descend. That shows his humility. We submit to get ahead. You know, it's not like you need to go into God and then let him provide your needs. When you seek your needs yourself, you sometimes just don't seem to get them until you go that other direction. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7, um, I want to read to you his instructions for us because the Bible says, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus, who not have been found in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant, being found in the fashion of a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him because of this, and given him a name that is above every name, and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So he became humble and was given honor. When you become humble, that's when you will have honor bestowed on you. So now you have to make up your mind in which lifestyle you're going to follow. You can take the prideful way of the devil if you want to, but I'm telling you that way is down. You can take the way of Jesus Christ, which is the way of humility we talked about last week. It is true submission. And I'm telling you, that way is up. Listen, pride promotes dishonor. They can strut now if you want to. Did you know most of the people in America are egomaniacs, strutting their way to hell, thinking that they're just too good to be damned? You ask so many people on the street if they're going to hell or not, they well, I don't think so. I've been pretty good. I never kicked a cat, and I gave my kid money, and... I'm good. No. You have to submit. That's not it. Pride will bring you low, and it always has, and it always will. Pride, fifthly on your outline, precedes destruction. Look what it says in Proverbs 15, 22. It says this. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counsels, counselors, they are established. So godly counsel is important for you. Look at chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride will destroy you, and a haughty spirit is not needing God. You know, you don't go to God for your problems. You go to God after your problem. <laughs> Look at Proverbs 18, 12. It says this. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, not needing God, prideful. And before honor is humility. What are all these verses telling us? Well, they're telling us that pride precedes destruction. But I tell you, it's not just that a man is going to be humiliated. It's not just that. He's ultimately going to be destroyed. Why? Well, I already told you, because God hates pride. God resists the proud. God sets himself in battle array against the proud. And if you don't take time for God, he's going to break your life up. And the people around you are going to watch it happen. For example, Pride produces national ruin on your outline. You see, our nation will come to naught unless we repent. We have pride parades. And it's the repentance of humiliation that God is looking for. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, he says, If my people which would call me by my name, Christians they are, and humble themselves and pray, then I will hear their prey and forgive them of their sin, and then I'm, I will heal their land. But also pride will produce on your outline domestic ruin. I mean homes. <coughs> homes become battlegrounds because of pride. And then next to that, pride produces financial ruin. Also, if you don't tie and stuff, your money will go. If you don't do what the Lord says and stuff, He's going to find an area and he's going to bring you down. And do you know why so many people are in financial bondage because of pride? Because they're buying things they don't really need, with money they don't really have to impress people they don't really like. So often we reason we get in trouble is because the neighbors keep buying things we can't afford. Isn't that true? And we say, we want that too. And we try to keep up so many 
so many people will want so many of these other things, they'll just quit tithing to get it. And so often it's wanting more than somebody else. And next, I want to show you pride on your outline produces emotional ruin. Do you know what pride will do? It will ruin you emotionally because it will make you a slave on your outline to the opinions of other people. It's like you've got to have that right alligator on your shirt. You've got to have the right emblem sewn on your hip pocket of those jeans, that brand name. And I tell you, listen, it's a form of slavery worrying about what others think. That will never be satisfied. And ultimately, it will ruin you emotionally. But last but not least, pride brings eternal ruin. Eternal ruin. Because I mean that soul in the end is going to be destroyed in hell, and it's all because of pride. You know, Jesus told of two men that went up to the temple and prayed. One was a Pharisee and one was a publican. And the Pharisee was a self-righteous person. But his religion was only a cosmetic that covered a horrid, hateful, prideful heart. And he prayed. He said, oh, Father, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I fast. I fast twice a week and I pay tithes on everything I possess. And he said, I'm not a thief. I'm not an extortioner like that man over there. And he pointed us over there at that Republican over there. Well, this tax collector, he was down there on the floor. And ultimately, this Pharisee strutted in the face of God by bringing that other person into his prayer by doing that. The other person that was the deep sinner, the Bible says he smote himself on the chest and he bowed his head and wouldn't so much as even lift his eyes to heaven in shame. And he prayed, oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he didn't say that. The Greek says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner, the sinner, the biggest sinner. And he recognized that he was a sinner of sinners, which evidenced he had a broken heart, a contrite heart. That's important when you come to God. Is your heart broken? Do you really mean it? And Jesus said, I tell you that this man, I mean the one that said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, is the one that went home justified rather than the other one. Two men went home from the church that day. One went home dignified, and the other one went home justified. One went home dignified and proud, and the other one went home justified and restored. And the devil is going to keep saying to you this, keep your dignity. Don't admit that you're in need for God. And he said, you'll never be saved anyway. Maybe, well, you might say, well, I'm not that bad, though. And I'm telling you that pride is not about that. It's a matter of the heart. And this man said that, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men are. And you see, he was comparing himself with other men. He should have had his eyes on the Lord, comparing to him. Because then that would have brought humility. Remember when Job saw the Lord, he says, I hate myself. I abhor myself. When Isaiah saw the Lord by he said, Woe unto me, I am unclean. I can't stand it. When Peter saw the Lord in his glory, he said, Depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. When Daniel came in front of the Lord, he said, My comeliness has turned into corruption. And you see, God causes humility before honor. He spoke with God. But what was it like before he spoke to God? His flat on his face. And we sing these words, When I survey the wondrous cross of which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all of my pride. Stop comparing yourself with others. You compare yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, and I tell you, that will bring humility. And I want to tell you today that there are none so good that need not be saved, and there's none so bad that he cannot be saved. Did you hear that? There's none that's so bad that cannot be saved, but there is none so good that need not be saved. The devil says, don't go down there and commit to Christ. Don't start making commitments. Don't. You're going to make a fool of yourself. Don't admit that you have the need for God. Don't confess that you're a sinner. You're just as good as anybody else. You're going to look weak. Stonewall it. But I tell you, it is pride that precedes destruction. And a haughty spirit or those who do not seem like they need God goes before a fall. You can mark my words. And so tell me, rather than admit your need to the Lord and rather humble yourself before the Lord, let me ask you, would you rather have spiritual destruction? Because I tell you, if you don't do anything to put some God thoughts in your mind, you're going to go down. You are going to go down. And when you get ready to die, you're going to be just like all the people that I have to minister to that don't have the Lord. They're scared to death. Only Christians aren't afraid. And you say, well, I'm just not that bad. 
I don't think I'm going to go into spiritual destruction. I tell you that if you were to take four billion people that are on the face of the earth and add them all together and that died since Adam and yet compound them by adding all the people that are going to come into being before the end of time, before the end, and you take all of them and put every one of them together, all of their goodness, and put it all in one place and extract from every one of those individuals the very best attributes from each one of those individuals and take all those attributes and put it in one man, that man would still have to kneel and pray and say, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Do you know that? All of mankind is contaminated and the only chosen ones are the ones that choose Jesus. I tell you, the worst form of badness is human goodness. When the human goodness becomes a substitute for the new birth. And listen, the reason that some people are destroyed forever is because of pride. They think they're okay. I've watched people and I've seen where pride sits down in the seat right beside a person. And, they, and it says, don't admit your need. This will be over pretty soon. Just wait. We'll be out of here. Don't confess that you need the Lord. And I'm telling you, dear friends, that God resists the proud and you will be his adversary. That means enemy. Because all those that have not received Jesus Christ, that makes God so mad. He died for you and you won't accept him? That means you're his enemy. You must accept Jesus died for you. And I'm telling you, God resists the proud. But remember, on your outline, he gives grace to the humble. And you need him. Oh, I tell you, what we need today is God's grace because remember, pride precedes destruction. I tell you, God is going to come back and punish the world. And he's going to punish all of those that don't seek God. You know people that don't seek God? They don't think they need God? Don't care about it or anything? He's coming back to punish them. And all of those that don't have time for God, He's going to punish those. And all those who didn't care about the commandments of God. And all those that think that they have a better way than submission to God. He's going to come and punish them. And you know too often it is pride on your outline. And that unbelief that keeps many from coming to Christ. Because it's not that they do not believe the gospel. Look at Satan believes the gospel. He just doesn't obey. But pride will keep you from all eternity. And keep you separated from Jesus Christ. Either because maybe you're too embarrassed to come. Oh, why do you think? Well, maybe you don't think you really need to. Or maybe you're going to do it one day, but you're just a procrastinator. But if you watch, you can find yourself, find yourself too late. Or remember, he that exalteth himself shall be, on your outline, debased. He that exalteth himself shall be debased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So don't forget that. So today, would you come and say to the Lord, Lord, in my hand, no price do I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. I have nothing for him. All my works I do for the Lord I will follow me to heaven, but really I have nothing. I can only cling to the cross. And that's the faith of a Christian. And would you say, Lord, I lay my spiritual and intellectual pride in the dust and I just yield myself to you. And Lord, I trust you to deliver me from this horrible problem of pride. Praise the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your message. And we just pray that it would, it would stick in our hearts and be sealed there, Lord, to help us understand the difference in the kind of pride that you don't like in the kind that we think is pride. Help us to have a discerning spirit, Lord, so we would understand when we're going off. Let the referee blow the whistle when we get out of bounds, Lord, and help us to be humble. Humility. Humility and pride are the opposites, Lord. And I just pray that you would just teach everyone here how important it is that we submit to you with everything we do. We submit to you for all decisions all things, and to help us encourage other people that don't think that they need you, Lord. Help us to let them know that they do need you. They do need you. Lord, we thank you again for your message. Thank you for everything. Lord, we turn our lives over to you right now. We ask for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we have one last song. No other name. If we could stand together, we will go ahead and sing this last song.
We have a very powerful sermon next week about America, and I hope that you are able to come, and uh, it should be good. I don't think we're going to have a 4th of July around here. They said it's canceled, so we'll see what happens. No other name but the name of Jesus. No other name but the name of the Lord. No other name but the name of Jesus. It's worthy of glory and worthy of honor and worthy of power.